you have your Bible, let me invite you to turn for uh, the last time in this series to the Old Testament book of Malachi. Today we conclude our look at this book. We've been here for the last uh, two months or so. And today we come to just the final three verses of the book as Malachi sort of concludes and wraps up his uh, warning and his call to Israel with these final few verses. So Malachi chapter 4, if you will follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read verses 4 through 6, and then we'll look into this passage together. Malachi chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Let's pray. Our Lord, we do thank you for these last few months in the book of Malachi. And now as we come to these final words, this final encouragement and call to action, we pray that it would settle deep within our own hearts. Give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts that are opened, hearts that are awakened, hearts that are filled with love for you. Bless our time in your word now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Not too long ago, we were having dinner with my parents. And as we were sitting at the table before we began, my mother came over and reminded my dad that he needed to take his pills. So he reached into his pocket he pulled out this small little plastic container, popped it open, and he um, poured out a little pile of multicolored, multi-shaped medicine. And we sat there, kind of nobody was talking. We were just watching him take his pills one at a time, slowly. And after a moment, he kind of broke the silence, and he looked over at me and said, this is what you had to look forward to. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, when you're a kid, you get together with your friends and you talk about who has the most baseball cards. He said, when you get my age, you get with your friends and you brag about who takes the most medicine every single day. He said, hey, this is pills for this and this pills for this and went through his whole list and, you know, it's amazing how many different medicines he has to take. Some of you understand that feeling, don't you? You have bottles and pills and containers for every little thing that you have to deal with. Wouldn't it be great if we could just take one pill for every ailment? That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Just, just one, you know, simple panacea. Uh, we, we could call it a cure-all. You know, just one pill that you take. I can see the obnoxious TV commercials now, you know. Do you have bunions and baldness or headaches or heartaches or ear, you know, just one pill that you could take for everything. It would be a huge relief. The only people who wouldn't like it are pharmacists. Bruno, my apologies to you, but uh, the rest of us would just love the 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 privilege uh, the convenience of just one simple pill. Of course, that idea is far-fetched, medically speaking. But it's not that far-fetched, theologically speaking, especially in light of the last three verses of the book of Malachi. Over the last four chapters, Malachi has, has done his work, not simply as a prophet, but you could say in some ways, he's done the work of a good physician, a doctor. He's been diagnosing what has ailed the nation of Israel. 
He has been testing them and weighing them. He's, he's gone through and shown them their problems. And as sort of a good doctor, he has diagnosed and he has told the nation of Israel emphatically, you have a serious heart problem. He says there's a heart condition that you have that needs to be addressed. In fact, as you've noticed over the last few weeks, they really don't just have sort of one heart problem. As you've noticed, they've got seven different heart problems. He has gone through systematically and rebuked them for issue after issue after issue. They have a half-hearted sense of appreciation for God in chapter 1, a half-hearted sense of worship of God. There's been a half-hearted sense of fear of God, a a half-hearted service of God, a half-hearted confidence in God, half-hearted giving to God, and they had half-hearted family values, which were gifts of God. And he goes through and he points to all seven of these issues and he's rebuked them for each one right down the line. And you would expect that if they have seven problems, there are seven prescriptions. There are seven different things that they need to do, one for each of their issues. But as we come to these final verses of Malachi, Malachi sort of rolls them all into one and says, yes, you have these seven issues, these seven things that he's rebuked them over, but he comes back and he concludes by giving them one simple prescription. The, the, the entire, the, this whole book of Malachi, it is punctuated with a, with a single exclamation point of how they can be cured. He's exposed their sickness, he's, he's shown them her, their half-heartedness, and he comes back in these last verses, and this is what he tells them. Malachi concludes this book after rebuking them and rebuking them and rebuking them. He comes to the end and says, if you want to be cured, Israel, you can be cured... If you will simply trust and obey God again. He says you need to come back to trust Him. And you need to return in obeying Him. The the underlying problem of all of these other issues is a lack of trust and a lack of obedience to God. If half-heartedness is the problem, then he basically concludes by saying the, 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 the answer, the solution, is a wholehearted trust and a wholehearted obedience to your God. Come back to Him, he says, and trust and obey. I don't know about you, but it's easy sometimes to overcomplicate the Christian life, isn't it? To make it a lot harder than it really is. We, we hear about the latest and greatest books or the latest fads and we have to run to Lifeway and buy this. Maybe this will fix it and maybe this will get it and maybe if I just listen to this. And we, we sometimes run all over the place trying to find a solution and it very well may be as simple as trust and obey. That may be the underlying problem to what plagues us. And Malachi says in Israel's case, in this instance for God's people, that was their issue. Some of us here this morning, you find yourself in a place where, you know, you're, you're not trusting God as you should. You know of God, but it's hard to let go. You're holding on to it, and you're, you're, you've got it right there, and it's hard to pry your hands off of it, and you need to trust. Others of you, it may have begun with trust, but it hasn't translated into to full-fledged obedience. I know what God wants me to do, I know what I need to do, but you find yourself hesitant. And God's word to you this morning from this section of Malachi is trust and obey. This is how we return wholeheartedly to Him. These are two actions that He gives the nation of Israel. And God's word gives to us this morning as well. Two actions for this wholehearted return to God. Action number one in verse four. He tells them very simply, number one, look to God's word and obey it. His prescription for the end of this book, for what they need to do to return to Him, is first of all, He tells them, look to God's Word and obey it. Look how verse 4 begins. Remember the law of Moses, my servant. Now, again, go back with me for a moment. We've gone through 
through four chapters of these disputes where God speaks and then Israel speaks, and then God speaks and Israel speaks, and they go back and forth and back and forth, and they've sort of quarreled. Now we get to the end, and there's no more quarreling to be had. God gets the final word. God gets to, to, to speak last, and God is the one who speaks up, and then it says, okay, despite the dispute, despite the quarrels, despite your hesitation, let me tell you what, what you need at this point. And so he comes in verse 4 and he tells them, first of all, to remember the law of Moses. Now, we're familiar with this word, to remember. But it may mean something a little different than what we think it means. Okay? So as Ricky Ricardo used to say, we've got some explaining to do to understand what this means. So the, the idea to remember, when we think of it, we often think of remembering simply as, as something that we do up here in our brain in our minds, that, that we recall some facts, we recollect some data, we, we bring to our minds, we sort of Google our mental hard drive, and we come up with some information. And, and we think of remembering simply as sort of reminiscing. But, but what the word here means, and what it's intended in Scripture, it, it's not simply cognitive. The word it is implying behavioral. It's not just a cognitive act up here. It is supposed to translate into your behavior. It means to keep something in mind so that you put it into action, to put it into practice. It's not just spend some time meditating on this. It's, it's, it's meditate, yes, but let it translate into doing something. It's sort of like when your, your teenage son or daughter is taking the car out for the first time after getting their license, and you say to them, one of the last things you say is, remember your seatbelt, or remember your speed. It, it, that's not simply, you don't want them just to sit in the driver's seat and go, right, seatbelt, okay, right, okay, I can, I can remember that. Speed, hmm, okay. Just, just, it's not just to contemplate or to reflect. It means wear your seatbelt. Watch your speed. Do something with it. And that's what Malachi is saying here. It's not so much about thinking as it is about doing. We're all familiar with the shortest verse in the Bible, right? What is it? You can tell me. That's right, Jesus wept. The second shortest verse in the Bible also comes from, it comes from the lips of Jesus. And it's when he said in Luke chapter 17, three words, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Now that's not just a, a mental recall, it's don't do what she did. Don't make the same mistake. There's a sense of urgency in remembering, but put it into practice and, and go do it. And so he comes to Israel and says, listen, this is the bottom line. You need to remember the law of Moses, my servant. Go back to it. Notice what they are supposed to remember. He calls it, first of all, the law of Moses. And then he says, even the statutes and ordinances. So he, he refers to three things. The law, the statutes, and the ordinances. Now, these are not three different things to remember. It's three ways of saying the same thing. Oftentimes in Hebrew, they would emphasize a point by repeating it. Repetition was how you would like highlight something or put it in bold type print. They would repeat themselves. And so he's repeating what you need to go back to is the law, the statutes, the ordinances. Call it what you will, he says. The Torah, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, whatever it is, go back to that. Because what you received in that is the very word of of God. Exodus 31, 18 says that as Moses was there, that God gave to him the tablets, and it says that it contained the law of God written by the very finger of God. He says, Israel, you have a treasure, you have a gift, this special book that's been given to you. You need to take up that revelation to remember it and then to obey it. Notice what he says here, statues and ordinances which I commanded him. Isn't it easy sometimes to rationalize and to think of them not as the Ten Commandments, but as the Ten, um, the ten uh, Options? Or, or, or to look at God's Word and say, well, maybe I could. 
Well, I know what it says, but I really don't want to do that. I really don't feel like it. And, and Moses, or Malachi says here, no, no, no. This is the law of the statutes that have been commanded. Commands exist to be obeyed. They're not options. He says, go back to it, look to the word of God, and make plans to obey it. Now, notice this one little detail here. He says, which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel. What does he mean by that? That seems like one of those just kind of Bible like statements that he throws in there. Remember the law which I gave at Horeb and Israel and so forth. Just kind of throws that in. It's, it's not incidental to the passage. When he speaks, when he highlights the fact it was given at Horeb to, to Israel. Now, what is Horeb? I was actually, Friday night, believe it or not, I was having dinner with someone, and they were talking about a church, and it was Horeb Baptist Church. And he looked at me and said, what's Horeb? I don't, like, don't even know. And I said, funny, you should ask. I have been studying Horeb all week. I know exactly what it is. Horeb is just another name for Mount Sinai the place where Moses received the law. And so he says here, go back to the law, the ordinances, the statues that was given to Moses back there at Sinai. Now, why did he say that? I I think in part, it's God's way of reminding them of of the importance of doing this. I'll explain it this way. At our home, when we have dinner as a family, uh, we get together and it's like, it's like sometimes from meal to meal, you parents can understand this, you go from meal to meal, it's like the children forget how to act at the dinner table. It's like all of a sudden the dinner table becomes like a carnival, like food is flying and people are crying and like I see legs and I'm like, what is happening? You know, everything just, you know, goes crazy. And so I have to tell, I, you know, sometimes I say, guys, you've done this before. We do this three times a day and, and for how many years? One of you eight years, one of you, you should know by now what we do at the dinner table. By saying here, go back to the law that was given to you at Horeb, Horeb, what is God saying? God is in essence saying, listen, the the law of Moses was given in 1400 B.C. Malachi is preaching in 400 B.C. They've had the law for a thousand years. And they still haven't gotten it. He's, he's showing them, listen, after a thousand years, you guys should have it by now. You need to go back to, to, to what you learned at Horeb. I remember seeing a poster one time. It said, everything I need to know in life, I learned in kindergarten. It, that's pretty true. You learn to say please and thank you. You learn to wait your turn. You learn to share. I mean, a lot of most important things in life, you learn at that early, early age. Malachi says, Israel, everything you need to know about life, you learned at Sinai. You learned at Horeb. So go back there. Pick up the law again, look to it, read it, understand it, and obey it. Israel's problem here, listen closely, it was not that they lacked God's word, it's that they neglected God's word. It's not that they lacked it, it's that they forgot it. You know, we, we just saw a video a few moments ago in the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and the, the numbers of people who, who simply do not have access. For many people in the world, that, that is their obstacle. That is their problem. They have a Bible access problem. They couldn't get it if they wanted to get it, if they knew it existed even. The, 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 for many people, the, the issue is a Bible access problem. But let's be honest, for us, our problem is not access. Our problem is amnesia. We forget it. We have it on the shelf. We might have dozens on the shelf. But the Bible on the shelf does you no good if there's no Bible in yourself. And he says, look to it again and obey it. Pick it up. Learn it. Remember it. And do it. This is not just an Old Testament call. In Second Peter, just listen to this. In Second Peter, he begins his letter... Listen to the way Peter begins his letter. He says in, in, in verse 12, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these, of these things, even though you already know them. I consider it right as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. 
So he starts the letter by saying three times, remember, remember, remember. Don't forget. Don't neglect. Don't set it aside. He says, you know this already. For most of us, it's not that we need to learn something new or there's special insights. It's that we need to obey the parts of the Bible we already know. And he says, go back to the law, pick it up, learn it, memorize it. But sometimes we we find it very difficult. We're kind of like those of you who've seen the kids' movie, Finding Nemo. We're like Dory. You remember Dory? She can't remember five seconds what somebody else said or what she said. And we just forget. We read our Bibles, love your enemies. And we go, yes, God, I love my enemies. And we get in traffic. Oh, I hate these people. What's wrong? Get out of my way, you know. That's not an access problem. We need to remember. By the way, how do you do this? Let me give you two ways to do this. One way to look to God's Word and obey it, number one, is review God's Word every day. Review. Now, I'm not saying read God's Word. I'm, 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 I'm assuming read it. I'm saying take time to review it throughout the day. If you have your devotions in the morning and you read the Bible, don't just read it there and leave it and then go throughout the day. At lunchtime, you sit down to eat, and just before you give thanks, bow your head and take a moment and say, now what did I read again? And think about it. You sit down at the dinner table before you go to bed. Don't just think of God's Word once and read it and leave it there. Make it a constant pattern in your life. Keep this book of the law constantly before you, as Joshua was told. Review God's Word. Let the Word of God be your constant companion. For some of us, our phones are our most constant companion. Maybe we should replace some of that with God's Word. Another suggestion that I would make, not only review the Bible, but make spend time memorizing the Bible. Let's be honest. Some of us in this room, we have not memorized a Bible verse intentionally since we were this tall in Sunday school class. And that's not good. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We don't have to memorize the whole thing, but there are are certainly some advantages for us to take God's word, to have it before us, and to have it in our minds so that we can obey it. You don't know where to start? Go get you some three-by-five cards and just start writing out the Sermon on the Mount. Just put a verse on a card and stick it in your pocket and work on it. And memorize God's word. Take it in. Look to it so that you can obey it. That's his first action. The second action that he tells them. Not only do they look to God's word, but secondly, they are to look for God's work and trust it. They should look for God's work and trust it. Notice how verse 5 begins. One of my favorite words in the Bible. Behold. I love that word. It's just it's this attention-grabbing interjection. It, it's a way of God kind of shaking you and saying, now listen to this. It, it, it Here it has the idea of look, open your eyes, pay attention. Be on the lookout, he says, because something is coming. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He gives them a sign. He tells them to look back to the law of Moses. And now he says, look forward to the coming of Elijah. He says, I'm going to send him before that great and terrible day. Now, we could spend an hour talking about who is Elijah and what does he mean by this and why does he refer to him and why Elijah and not other prophets and, and look at all that. I'll just say a couple of comments about this. First of all, I think it's significant. He doesn't tell them to say, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the Tishbite. They they thought it was going to be literal, actual Elijah who ascended in a chariot of fire was going to descend. And Israel had this expectation of the actual Elijah coming back. That's why when John the Baptist comes and he's preaching, what do they ask him? Are you Elijah? Elijah? They had this expectation that, that Elijah went up in a chariot of fire and, and John the Baptist preached pretty fiery sermons and they thought, fire, fire, okay, maybe this is that guy. Is this him? Are you Elijah? And you know what he says? No. And then in an incredibly 
ironic and, and seemingly contradictory way, later, when asked about it, Jesus says, by the way, you know who Elijah is? It's John the Baptist. Wait, what? I thought he said he wasn't Elijah. But now you're saying he is Elijah? Who's right? Well, they're both right. Because when they were asking John the Baptist, are you Elijah, his answer and what they were assuming is, are you the literal, actual guy who ascended that is now descended? Are you that Elijah? And he's saying, no, I'm, I'm not him, I'm John. And what Jesus was alluding to is what the, the, the angel told John's father, Zacharias, in Luke chapter 1. He said, your child, when he comes, he's going to come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He, he is going to be a fiery, finger-pointing, crowd-stirring, you know, heartbreaking kind of preacher who's going to confront people and call them out, and he's going to preach like Elijah did. And he says when he comes, he's going to, to come in that way, and he's going to preach in that way. And that's why Jesus said he is, in fact, Elijah. But then elsewhere, Jesus said, Elijah is still to come. So which is it? Is he already come or is he still to come? It seems to be that the coming of Elijah happens in sort of two stages. That the, the coming of Elijah happened with the first coming of Jesus in John the Baptist. And that we're still awaiting the second coming of Jesus, which will be preceded by fiery preachers that will, that will warn of the judgment of God. That's what he's saying here. When he comes, he was going to come warning before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now notice the purpose of his warning. Uh, verse 6. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now notice, he points out again. What's Israel's problem? It's a heart problem. He says, it's your heart. That's the issue. It's not the nations around you, though you want to blame them. It's not your environment. That's not to blame. The problem lies in your heart. And you need your heart renewed. You need your heart restored. And he says here, when Elijah comes, that's the work he's going to do of turning fathers and sons towards one another. That may be literal fathers and sons because family, there were family issues going on. Or it may simply be Israel as a whole, that, that the nation towards Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, towards their ancestors, that they will, they will come together once again in the way that God intended. But regardless, he says that his work is one of restoration. And he's going to come and renew your hearts. And then notice how he closes. So that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Do you know what you call not getting what you do deserve? That's called mercy. Not getting what you do deserve is called mercy. He says here, even though you deserve for me to come and smite the land, when Elijah comes and he preaches, your hearts will be restored. And God is saying, and through him, I'm going to show you mercy. I'm going to see to it that the curse is, is lifted, that your hearts are restored, that Elijah will come. And in all of this, I'm going to do a great work. And the curse that you deserve that should come to you, it will be erased, it will be done away with, it will be gone. So he tells them, not only do you look back to God's word, but you look forward to God's work. The work of sending Elijah, the work of restoring their hearts, and the work of withdrawing his curse. I find it interesting how this book comes to a, a, a close. Malachi gets to the end, he's diagnosed their problems, he comes to the end and says you need to trust, you need to obey. And in doing this, he points to two key figures. He points to Moses and Elijah. He tells them, remember Moses, remember Elijah. He tells them, look to Moses and look to Elijah. He tells them, pay attention to Moses and pay attention to Elijah. And here we find these two men, these two giants of the Old Testament. We see their ministries coming together and converging at this one point. And yet there is one other point where these two men by name, their ministries converge and their ministries come together. And it was that blessed and glorious place when Jesus pulled back his flesh and unveiled his glory and in the brilliance of his splendor there at the Mount of Transfiguration, two men appeared with him. 
Moses and Elijah. And they talked with him. And there we see the ministry of these two great men converge and come together and point to one man, which is Jesus. The Father spoke from heaven at that moment and He said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But He didn't stop there. He said, One more thing. He said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Just as you listened to Moses in the past, and just as you listened to Elijah in the past, understand that now Moses and Elijah listen to this guy, and you need to turn your attention, and you need to listen to him too. The great ministry of Moses and the great ministry of Elijah prepared the way for the greater ministry of the coming of Jesus. And it's in Him and Him alone that our hearts are truly restored. It's in Him and Him alone that the curse has now been lifted. It is in Him and Him alone that we are reminded of the mercy of God that precedes the terrible day of God's judgment. That in Christ, we are given new hearts. Whole hearts. Renewed hearts. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Malachi concludes his book with this very simple prescription. At the risk of oversimplifying, it's what we will sing in that song. In fact, we'll sing in a moment. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That is the word of God to us this morning. So let's pray. Our Lord, we are grateful for these final words from the prophet Malachi and how they point us not just to Moses and not just to Elijah, but how Moses and Elijah point us to Jesus. And we pray that our hearts would be renewed in trusting Him, that our hearts would be renewed in obeying Him, and that our lives individually and collectively would be a testimony that King Jesus is worthy of our trust and obedience. We thank you that in Christ the curse has been lifted. We thank you that in Christ our hearts have been renewed. We thank you that in Christ the great ministry of Moses and Elijah find their perfect completion. And we pray that we, Lord, would find ourselves listening to him as well. Father, we pray that you would grant us your grace. Show us your mercy. And help us each moment as we seek to trust and obey. And for there anyone here that doesn't know Christ, I pray that today they would be that first act of trust, throwing themselves on the mercy of God, seeking Jesus as their Savior and Lord. We pray that our hearts would be pulled, that our hearts would be stirred towards greater love for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.